stay away from the noise you know stay focused i keep saying it while they stay tweeting you stay focused brilliant i understand that this film was like 12 years in the making what was it about the story that made you really determined to get it to the screen yeah 12 yeah. years in the making um it was supposed to be my second movie mm -hmm. and i always find that um, interesting to think about because I think to myself well if it had been my second movie if I had been allowed to make it because I was told it was too big for me there would be no bell right, um, yeah. and there would be no um, a United Kingdom because those are two movies that I kind of made to prove that way hands touch wasn't too big for me what kept you persevering because that is a long time but what kept you first what was it about that story that made you so determined to yeah. tell it well i think realistically i understood a long time ago that on average at least at that time it, it takes seven years to get a Brit british film off the ground so understanding that you know these babies aren't born overnight like literally mm -hmm. um that was the first thing and I think I kind of went in blind and relative naive, relatively naively because I just kind of kept thinking well it'll be next year, it'll be in the next 18 months, you know, somehow and I'm, I'm sure that's something that a lot of filmmakers recognise but I think that um, when I discovered the story and I discovered the story because I was making my first film A Way of Life in Wales and I discovered that Wales had some of the oldest black communities and how is it possible that I didn't know that? And I wanted to know more about people like me and you who are sort of born of the African diaspora, but raised in Europe. So we're essentially Afro-European, if you like. Mm -hmm. I wanted to know, how did the Afro-French, you know, get there? And really, genuinely, how long ago? Not just the history we're, yeah. we, we're familiar with, but what's the real history? And Afro-Germans, you know, Afro-Dutch people, all of those. Mm -hmm. And... Um, but once I really started Googling and, and trying to find out about the history of, of, of uh, people of color in Germany, and I had all these assumptions. And as I started you know, exploring the real history, I, all my assumptions were being smashed. Mm. And as my assumptions were smashed, I realized this is a story that must be told because we all kind of judge history through our own gaze, through our own experience. We, uh, and our history is the history that matters, you know? We have this feeling that um, whether we admit it or not, or we acknowledge it or not, that if the history doesn't kind of fit with our idea of history, then it's not history or it's not real. And I, for me, I thought it was so important to get this, this story out. But then when I sat down and interviewed, met with um, black survivors of the, the Holocaust, black survivors of World War II in the period, I was absolutely determined that I wanted to try and make a film before um, they were gone, Yeah, you know, and so that, that kept me going. Right, yeah. And with that sort of element of period in some of your past films, do you think that you have a responsibility to tell stories that haven't been seen by the mainstream? Well, the key main story that I wanted to tell that was a black story, you know, steeped in history was this one. Mm. And... Um, you know, um, when I was sent the, the picture postcard of the painting of Belle, um, you know, and I originally just was just like, you're never going to let me make the film I want to make. You're never going to let me write the story I want to write. So thanks and good night. Mm -hmm. And then it eventually came round because I realised that this was a way, perhaps a pathway to getting Where Hands Touch made. At that point, I kind of realised it was very, very important for me um, to get this right. And I really thought much like my first film, that I was going to be making this in a bubble and maybe a few British people would get to see this film. I had no idea that Belle would blow up in the way that it did on both sides of the water and that I would, in, it, in acknowledging um, the kind of story that I wanted to see on screen, um, you know, which is a period drama that involved someone of colour, that I would actually be feeding into what so many women who look like me out there also wanted to see on screen. I, I didn't even think of it in that way because, you know, I was a filmmaker who made one film. This was my second movie. I didn't expect many people to want to go and see that movie. So, yeah, that definitely a responsibility hit. Mm -hmm. and, and specifically with um, actually something that's very, very... What's the word I'm looking for? Um, 
very fragile like mm. a film like um, A United Kingdom where you've got a story about a black man who takes a white woman back to a country in Africa to be a queen, essentially meaning queen of the black women. Mm. That is such a fragile um, storyline that for me to be able to shape this story into something that I thought I could go and see were I not the filmmaker, um, you know, what would I want to see as a black woman well, definitely I would want to see the black females in Africa speaking and having an opinion. Mm -hmm. um, so in shaping it in, in, in that way, yeah, I definitely felt a responsibility, not just to tell stories that, um, that haven't been told, but also to, 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 to tell stories that are um, authentic. Yeah, let's talk a little bit about the response to the film. Obviously, there was a little bit of backlash on social media. Mm -hmm. How was that for you to receive it? And, and what did you think at the time? Because obviously, people hadn't seen it yet. I mean, that was interesting for me because I'm on my fourth movie. And in some ways, that's, um, you know, I've made some strides in the industry as a, as a black female. There are so few black British females who are making films. Um, and that films that cross over to America as well. Um, but at the same time, I realise that I'm really still at very much at the beginning of my career. If you think about Scorsese or you think mm -hmm. about Spielberg when they've only made four films, that was definitely mm -hmm. still the beginning of their careers. So um, I realise also that the stories that I tell um, are doing something very different. You know, not just putting a um, woman of colour um, behind the camera and encroaching on space that has previously not been ours. Mm. But I'm also, you know, often placing people of colour and um, sometimes women of colour at the centre of stories where we normally don't get to see them and again encroaching on other space. Mm. So I think what, what happens, what I understood and what I realised um, and what I, and I'm a bit of a geek so kind of what happens to me in that situ those kind of situations is I stand back and I kind of just observe society and I observe mm. how society's working and I go, wow, it's really ironic that, you know, what we're dealing with here is a film that where essentially we're talking about how children are supposed to find their moral code when they are bombarded with propaganda and they're bombarded with a narrative that has been hijacked by other people in order to... to, to uh, to to sway society in one direction or another, and um, you know these were the seeds in the 1930s that were that were planted in order for Hitler to be able to stand on the platform and do what he did, and so this is essentially a film about propaganda, and I kind of found it quite ironic that propaganda was being used to hijack this film, <laughs> and people of you know all different demographics were essentially telling me and social media what this film was about without even having said it you know seen it and I've so I found I also found it you know really ironic for instance that you know you had one particular um blogger who was sort of saying you know this is a film that has no Jewish people in it how can you make a film about you know Nazi Germany that has no Jewish people in it and of course hadn't even seen the film but that became the narrative and that became mm. her propaganda mm. um, and so for me I, I just at this particular these particular times I stand back and like a geek I sort of put my head to one side and I just kind of observe what's going on because what I write about the stories I tell they are intimate stories but they are essentially um, looking at society through the gaze of, of, of an intimate story and um, I, through my intimate gaze, I was simply looking at society and seeing how society was operating and seeing how, how easy it is actually to hijack a narrative and seize a narrative and um, how easy it, it is to actually gain um, a momentum and for people to jump on a bandwagon literally um, without actually even seeing something. And in 2019, where it's kind of like, we're in an era of politics where you might think thinking for yourself and watching a film and making your own judgments and not either going by what somebody says who has an agenda or what somebody says who hasn't seen the film, but going by your own thoughts might mm. be what might become your imperative, but, but, but it still isn't. And for me, that just, I'm an artist 
that just becomes something you observe and you, you, you know, you put it into your work. You know, I've always said, you know, you can write tweets or you can write scripts. Oh, I love that. I've got to use that as a nice sound bite. You know, <laughs> it's I, true. I know which one I choose. <laughs> <laughs> what was it like directing Amanda and George, seeing as they were quite young, but they had to do very emotional scenes? So what was like? Was, what was it like for you? Well, it was interesting because in casting, um, originally, I, I thought I was going to have to go, specifically for Amanda's role, Lena's role, I thought I was going to have to go for somebody much older and then have her playing down. And that really worried me because there is a level of authenticity mm. that goes. Because, there, you know, the, the whole point is that you're not dealing with people who are 25 years old whose minds have already been shaped and set but you are dealing with people who are tipping from childhood into early adulthood mm -hmm. and having their you know trying to shape their own minds in a world that's trying to shape their minds for them and so it was really important you know it was amazing that we got you know, Mandela arrived on set on her 18th birthday and that was really quite incredible the key thing about both of them is that they are just fundamentally so savvy and they're fundamentally savvy um, without losing any of that 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 newness of being young and um, being curious and um, which is exactly what we needed for their characters and and essentially being good people um, albeit in a world that is very very bad and is very very devastating for its time and so um, you know, we did a lot of talking and um, it was really important for me to share research with them. Um, it was really important for me to share, you know, the information that I had received from um, those survivors of World War Two that I'd met in Germany, you know, a long time before and recorded their interviews and, you know, shared some of what was said in those interviews with um, George and Amandla and ultimately, you know, what something that I do with all of my actors, which is just get them to to, to, to play with what, play to what is in their heart. So the question then becomes, well, what's in their hearts? And that's what you have to really sit and discuss before you go into each scene, before you go into each moment is, you, especially because you shoot not in order. You know, mm. you shoot the movie not in order. And so it's really important to really ground them and say, remember what's just happened. Remember what you're going to remember what's about to happen. Mm -hmm. But you don't know that yet. You know, you, you and, and really ground them in in the experiences and the feelings. I think what was really important for me also was to have a young um, woman of colour on screen who is experiencing a plethora of experiences and going through a learning curve that we simply haven't seen. Uh, or been allowed to see a woman of colour go through before. And I think, in fact, what that does, rather than humanising a Nazi who is a 16-year-old boy who's in the Hitler Youth, which was mandatory, and but for the grace of God go any of us who, who are not forced to be in an organisation that we would, you know, we would mm. never choose to be in if, if we, we had our own mind. Um, far from doing that, I think what it does is humanises a woman of colour on screen and says, you know, you, you, why should you be held to a higher standard? Why should you be the stronger, better, all-knowing? Why can't you just be a kid like every other kid? Why can't yeah. black women, black children just be like everybody else and be exposed and impacted and, and affected by all of the same things that other people in society are affected by. Why do we always have to be the ones to do better, mm. particularly when we're just children? And so by God, when, when Lena knows better, she definitely does better. And what this story is really about for me is a, as a young woman who's going through a journey where she's finding out what her moral code is, she's learning about the world around her specifically you know what's happening to Jewish people and where they're disappearing to and what it means to want to belong to a country that is killing its own people and when she discovers that we see who who Lena really is which is someone who gives which is someone who loves and someone who has strength and someone who is um, the true hero at the center of her own story we, we just don't get to see that with women of color often enough mm. 
Yeah. We, we work with a lot of creatives, and especially black women, and yes. they often feel that same perception, we have to be better, do more. We see you, and I know you said you're four films in, but we see you and you've done amazing films, you've done The Handmaid's Tale, you've got Billion Dollar Spy coming up as well. Um, but how has it been for you as a black female filmmaker and navigating the politics? I mean, I think, I think the key thing is that um, I don't. I haven't done any research. I don't know if there is another woman of colour out there that has, you know, had four movies distributed, um, who is also British mm -hmm. um, and and of African descent. I don't know, but 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 I, but I don't know any. And what I know is that oftentimes when you are, um, you know, walking down a path that you know alone. Um, there are struggles and those struggles come from within and without and what I mean is within your community and from outside of your community as well um, and there are a whole load of expectations and mm. uh, and people think that you know this idea that you make movies means that you're supposed to be making not just all of the people you know for all of the people all of the time but you know for all of the you know people that look like you all of the black people all of the time when actually what by by feeling that or implying that, what you're actually saying is that black people are a monolith and we're not. Mm. We don't think the same, we don't vote the same, we don't like the same things all of the time. We are not a monolith. And so once again, as an artist, I, I don't make movies for all of the people all of the time or <clears throat> all of the people who look like me all of the mm. time. I make movies for people who are gonna get my movies and get what I'm trying to do. Yeah, so. My advice to anyone who who wants to make films and looks like me is just, you know, stay away from the noise, mm. you know, stay focused. I keep saying it, while they stay tweeting, you stay focused. Brilliant. And is there a story, apart from Billion Dollar Spy, that you're really dying to tell, oh, that you yeah. just like a sneak sort of Yeah, I'm trying that. to find a way into the Yara Santua story. I'm mm. really trying to find yes. the way into the Yara Santua story, um, which for anybody who doesn't know is the story of a, a Ghanaian warrior woman who um, led the people of Ashanti to um, fighting um, the Europeans, the, the British mm. during um, Ghana's colonial, early colonial period. Um, but I also, you know what, I am, I want to get into that superhero world, but I want my superhero to be a black female, like black like me. So for anyone who's like questioning, no, not biracial, because you know, so you the, get that a lot, the, <laughs> the body of my work is not complete. Thank you for assuming it is, but it's not. Um, but yeah, you know, who is going to be that superhero woman who is at the center of her own story and is by golly, saving the world. Um, there are stories that I want to tell about white men, white women, black men, black women. You know, I want to do what Spielberg does. Spielberg can tell the color purple and he can tell, you know, and he can make Amistad and then he can go and make Lincoln. You know, he can make any movie he wants to make um, because he's good at what he does. And, you know, I want to have the freedom to be able to do the same. This is a fan question. Um, so what has been the transition been like for you from an actress to a filmmaker? I thank God that um, I was um, an actress, albeit a bad one. <laughs> um, but I still thank God for the experience of it because I think, you know, in many ways, um, being a young actress in the industry, um, first and foremost, meant that I just kind of c continued my naivety <laughs> into believing that um, I could be in the industry um, because I'd entered as someone who was quite young and didn't really question anything. But most importantly, I learned the language of television and filmmaking, and I think. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes, you know, again, all of my films are about um, um, how you can find your way to belonging and how you can find your way to fitting in or feeling just okay in yourself, even if everybody mm -hmm. else around you is different. And I think language is one way that that happens. Mm -hmm. um, you see it on the internet. You see how language is used to create tribes mm -hmm. and to create gangs and groups of people. And I think when going onto a film set, not understanding very basic language, you know, that seems, you know, when you know it, it seems so normal, but if you don't know it, it can be quite alienating. Find your line, hit your mark, the grip, the sparks, the, you know, the nifty 50, the naughty 40, you know, all of that language of, of lenses and, and uh, 
care about lenses. I'm just like, show me it like this. I just want to see her eye. And I don't care what lens you use, just show me what that looks like. Like that as well. Be with these I was. And he took off his trousers and he wee wee on the wall. 